Hello all, a uh, very warm welcome to this week's episode of the Sky Sports F1 podcast with me, Matt Baker. I hope you are well and enjoyed a brilliant Italian Grand Prix. To help me break that down and look into the big stories, I'm joined by Formula One world champion Nico Rosberg and F1 content creator Aldous. Hello to you both. Nico, I'll start with you. How was your weekend in Monza? Yeah, hi to both of you and hi to everybody who's listening. Um, it was it was very cool. I mean, it's, it's always a highlight to be in Monza. You know, the, the Tifosi, the history of the track the track itself, um, it's always a big challenge for the drivers. And the race was so so exciting. I mean, it was amazing fun to watch. Um, so all in all, Ferrari on pole, that was perfect. Giving Max Verstappen a challenge. Um, I think it was a great weekend. Aldous, what about you? How was, how was your weekend? Did you enjoy the race? Oh, it was fantastic. I think to, despite the Red Bull domination, we kind of knew what was coming, I think, on Sunday, especially with Ferrari being a little bit better in qualifying. But... Monza is always such a special event with the fans and just the atmosphere. You can't help not root for Ferrari when you get to Monza. But yeah, I think actually the last two races especially have been, I think, incredible. You know, with Zandvoort, kind of the mixed conditions in Monza, we did get a bit of a battle for the lead, which is always amazing. Loads of great battles as well. Uh, so yeah, definitely lots to talk about, which is, uh, which is great. Nice to have Formula 1 back, definitely. Definitely, yeah. We've had two cracking races, haven't we, since the summer break. Um, so 10 wins in a row for Max, but perhaps somewhat overshadowed by the incredible Ferrari performance in front of the Tifosi. So we'll get, we'll get into all of that. But before we do, I want to do our one-word race reviews. Now, Nico, I'm nervous about doing this this week because last time we did this, you ridiculed me for having a rubbish word. So I'm, gonna, I'm still going to go last, but I'm going to come to you first. What, uh, what's your one-word race review for uh, the Italian Grand Prix? Uh, I put you on the spot. Do we have an Italian? Do we have an Italian word that is understandable by English people, for like mm. thrilling, <laughs> or let's let's go let's go for thrilling. Yeah, perfect, perfect. And what what why have you picked thrilling? Just because of all the the overtaking or the the atmosphere from the fans. Yeah. Um, and then the battles on track. So many battles on track. Yeah, incredible. What about you, Aldis? I think I'm gonna have to go with uh, history, just because. It's difficult to appreciate it in the moment in terms of what Red Bull and Max have done. You know, 10 wins straight, beating that record uh, that was set by Sebastian Vettel and uh, quite po poetic as well. Obviously, you know, Seb being a Red Bull, obviously now surpassed by Max. But yeah, m my word is history because, it, you know, always, regardless of what happens in the future, you know, this will be the weekend where, where Max broke the record. And it still feels surreal because t to do something like that is just crazy. But the reliability and the speed and the consistency that he's had, yeah, just... 10 wins straight it just seems crazy uh, so yeah, yeah history is my one i yeah. think your word is nicer than my one because also the, <laughs> the the track is so historic and everything you know so it was multi see it was it was a layered word i had i had lots in it <laughs> <laughs> um okay right drum roll then uh hopefully nico you're impressed with this yeah, I, I feel you like... also have the possibility to skip it if you want matt if yeah. you're scared <laughs> no 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 don't we give him that out we can also move on <laughs> oh god i'm nervous uh i've gone for competitive which look, it still seems underwhelming i feel there should be more wordplay but i thought it was competitive throughout the weekend which i don't think is something we've said all season or for a lot of this season in formula one i thought competitive between carlos and max for the first 15 laps but also competitive throughout the field and i want to give a special mention to alex albon in the williams because i think when after quali we heard both mclaren drivers say you know oh we're not going to be over be able to overtake uh, the williams of alex in the straights and they were right it was it was very very competitive uh, in that midfield and battles everywhere so yeah competitive nico i think you're going to give me like a five out of ten or something for that at first i was like okay no this doesn't work but uh, now you explained it well and i think it yeah it was a nice word as well okay thank you very much thank you <laughs> uh, all right let's let's start by talking about ferrari because i think ferrari with a big story yesterday despite the records for max um Nico, could they have asked for a better weekend in the context of this season, in the context of the domination by Red Bull? Could they have asked for a better weekend? Well, I don't know. I mean, of course, in the context of the season, um, they would probably have taken a fight with Red Bull in a third place and a fourth place at Monza. Um, but then once you get into the weekend and you're seeing their speed and they get pole, probably they would have wanted a little bit more um, than, than to be beaten by both Red Bulls, you know, coming through and all, all of them overtaking them. Um, so, but, but in general, yes, I think they should be quite pleased with the weekend that they had. Mm. Aldous, do you think it was the best Ferrari performance of the year so far? I think so, because I think Baku was quite close. Obviously, Leclerc was on pole there, but Sainz was kind of nowhere that, that weekend relative to Leclerc. This, this was... This was a strong weekend by the entire team. I think Charles was a little bit on the back foot. He went a little bit wrong on setup, he said. But 
I think they are going to leave happy in the context of the season. I mean, again, Max passed them on lap 15. I was, honestly, I was surprised it even took that long. I think Max was kind of biding his time and I think uh, GP kind of had to hold him back a little bit, to be honest, at one point. But yeah, I think, again, they have to be happy. Um, but it's frustrating, as like, like Nico said, when you get pole position, when you get, you know, especially when you have such a quick car on that track, you... You want to believe that the win is there, and especially for Ferrari at Monza. So, yeah, I think there will be a small part of them that will be disappointed. They almost threw it away, actually, with some really both amazing and also scary battling by both of the drivers at the end of the race. Uh, but I think, again, context of the season and where they are moving into third in the championship as well, I think they're going to leave the weekend quite happy, if not a little bit disappointed because the win, you know, they always would have dreamt of that, especially after Saturday. Nico, what about that battle between Carlos and Charles at the end there? Do you, do, I, mean, there were, I saw footage of Charles going up to Fred Vasseur in the paddock and checking his pulse after, <laughs> after the race because it must have been nerv nervy for the Ferrari pit wall. But do you think it was the right decision to allow them to race and to go as, go as hard as they did in, in those final few laps? Uh, uh, right decision. Um, I mean, uh, uh, that's a difficult question. Uh, for us fans, obviously, yes. Uh, for us fans, obviously, yes. Probably for the Ferrari team, um, I'm not sure. I mean, pr Toto might have said, you know, just hold position now. Um, because are they in a close championship fight in the constructors also? I think they are, no? Against they are, yeah. So Ferrari at the moment on 228 and then Mercedes on 273. So, you know, 50, 40 points in it, plenty to go. So it's it's a yeah. close fight and okay, they so just overtook Aston view, Martin. So from that point of view, you might have said, you might have said hold position because it's such important points today um, in, in the attempt to still try and beat Mercedes. Um, but but anyways, yeah, for, for us, it was great, but it was so close to crashing. I mean, especially the last one with the big, big lockup from Charles. Wow, that is so close to crashing. So I was telling I was telling Fred Vasseur after the race that I really highly recommend that he he like asks both both drivers to sit down with him because he's he has the most authority, you know, that it's not the team manager or something, but that it's really the, the boss. Um, and really goes for, perhaps even first with one, then with the other and then combined, because then you really get the open story from one, the other. Um, because it's so important to be proactive. Because otherwise, if if one driver or the other, in this case, it would mostly be Charles, has a bad feeling here, it can quickly spiral that he will think that a next race, hey, I'm not going to yield next time, or I'm going to do the same next time, I'm going to get payback. Um, so he definitely has to proactively manage that, you know, and try and be supportive and neutral. And so he said he was going to do that today. It would be nice to be in that room, but uh, not possible. <laughs> Be a fly on the wall in that room, yeah, be, be incredible. Um, Nico, what's it like? I mean, I, I thought the the from the onboard footage, it was it looked so close. It looked, you know, when you're going at 200 miles an hour down those straights, wheel to wheel with your with your teammate, what is that like? Take us inside the cockpit. No, it is um, it is really really nail biting in the car as well, um, because the word imagine imagine crashing out your Ferrari teammate at Monza. T removing the po that would have been like whoa and it was so close oh my goodness um so it's it's proper it's proper nerve-wracking um in the car as well yeah but at the same time you're a racer and you don't want your teammate to end up the race in front of you uh at monza when you're quicker you know so uh um yeah yeah what if all this had gone the other way? What if they had have crashed out? Because I think we'd be doing a whole different podcast today, wouldn't we, about how, you know, Fred Vasseur has lost control of the drivers, the drivers are, are, are leading, the, uh, leading the Ferrari team. I mean, to be honest, they almost did. Uh, for me, it wasn't necessarily into turn one. It was with about two or three laps to go into turn, uh, turn four. You know, Carlos Sainz outbraked himself and overcooked the corner and almost took Leclerc with him. I, I thought that was a very kind of close you know, close call with uh, with both of those two, maybe even over the line by, by Sainz a little bit because he didn't even make the corner, but I think Charles was kind of, you know, ready for that. So it was so close to being a disaster. And again, we talk about the pressure on Ferrari. If that had happened at Monza, they'd be having a very different debrief right now, you know, in Maranello. So, in but again, that's the responsibility of the drivers. They have two very high-class drivers. I think for Carlos Sainz, he was he was working so hard at the beginning of the race to kind of stay ahead of Max that he wanted that podium. He was just going to hang on to it, uh, you know, for anything. But Leclerc did find that pace. But I think that, again, it's down to the drivers. That is your responsibility. And in the end, you know, they were kind of both, you know, really happy. Leclerc, I was actually surprised, you know, he was loving the battle after the race and, uh, you know, talking up about their great relationship. But I guarantee if they crashed, he wouldn't be talking about their great relationship. And I mean, this is actually, I want to know from, from Nico's side, when you did have those battles with Lewis, 
what was it like you know after the race in the debrief and was there any conversation about you know things going over the line with teammates well i also i remember myself in bahrain i then said on the i, I said after the race wow that was the most fun i've ever had in a racing car but actually the truth that was the most far from the truth possible because the truth was i was i was seriously angry and seriously uh um hurt from finishing second to lewis and it was zero fun so uh, because we always have, we have to as race drivers have to be a bit of hollywood you know to uh, you can't always say the truth obviously um because it's going to backfire otherwise and so that's why i was watching charles as he was just he just got beaten by his teammate who also ran him off the track once in the chicane where he where carlos locked up and charles had to do avoiding action and had to go straight as well um and then charles is sitting there and saying yeah, that was super fun, happy days, having a beer with Carlos. And I was looking, I was like, is this now genuine or is he pulling a Nico, you know, and saying the complete opposite of what he's feeling. Um, but I think it was pretty genuine. And in which case I was thinking it's a little bit too, uh, seems a little bit too um, nice guy somehow. Because he already, on the strategy already, he lost out the day before um, by allowing the team to give uh, Carlos a slipstream twice in the end of qualifying rather than it being split. You know, it should have been one person, one first run, the other person, the second run. And yet he allowed Carlos to have double slipstream in the qualifying already. So um, I'm not sure. Maybe uh, either he's a super, maybe he's just a super nice guy, and but that would be a little bit too nice, uh, I find. Mm. I think it's actually all about pressure really quickly in terms of Ferrari. They're trying to, especially after the last, I don't know, four or five years, we, even when they were bat batting for championships, I think everyone in that team is just trying to do their best to kind of lower the pressure on every single level, whether that's, you know, any tension in the drivers that's squashed straight away, any kind of talk about Ferrari struggling or any kind of crisis, you know, Fred Vasseur is very quickly to kind of, you know, support the team. So I think it's just that, that kind of, that, yeah, they're trying to kind of lower the pressure as much as they can because at Monza, there's enough of it already on Ferrari. Mm. There, cer there certainly is, yeah. Understatement, maybe. There's, it seems all, all the pressure. Speaking of pressure, I thought it was interesting what Fred Vasseur was saying across the weekend. He came into the weekend saying he was just going to treat it as any other normal weekend. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't matter that it's Monza. I think he very quickly realized that that's impossible to do as a Ferrari team principal. Nico, do you think this was a big weekend for Fred Vasseur in terms of getting the Tifosi on side, giving them something to cheer about this season? Do you think this is almost where perhaps the Tifosi maybe like really sort of fell, not fell in love with Fred Vasseur, but became more of a fan of him and his methods? Um, probably, yes. I think he's building his reputation, yeah. Um, but it's... It's the ultimate challenge, isn't it, to be in his position? My goodness, to rebuild the Ferrari team um, with the with with that pressure that's on his shoulders. Um, it's it's really the biggest challenge there is. So uh, I think he's doing well so far. Yeah, um, but uh, a big step <laughs> to to get the Tifosi on his side. A big step, I think, should be to get the Italian learned, um, so he can speak to them in Italian. And I, I challenged him on the Sky Sports microphone, and um, and all he could say was breakfast. So he still has some way to go. Probably start with the most important words first. Uh, Aldous, what, what do you think? He's taking make... Italian lessons. He's telling, taking Italian lessons, you know, so. Maybe he needs you, Nico, to give him some Italian lessons. <laughs> because how weird is that? I mean, for a French guy to be speaking English to Italian guys and leading the team, that is, that is a bit weird. Well, on that, I mean, do you think that's a genuine issue? You, you, you think that's a real problem that he has to sort out quick if he's going to get the, tif the Tifosi on side? Uh, I think so, yes. I think it would be of high importance to be able to speak uh, Italian from time to time. Yeah. Mm, goodness, that's a lot of pressure to also learn a language and, and you know, take Ferrari into uh, back, back to the top of Formula One. Uh, Aldous, how, how, how do you rate Fred Vasseur's time in the job so far? You know, obviously we're, we're sort of nearing two thirds of the way through the season. What, what would you give him out of 10? You know, that's actually a really difficult question because it's still very early. So much about what's happening this year is based off last year because of how late Bonotto left the team uh i think he's done a good job so far but again ferrari you know ferrari wants to win even he said i think after the race yeah third is great but they're not they're not looking for third as a as, as a as a result they're looking to win so i think he's done a good job so far i definitely think you know even on the language front you have to kind of assimilate to the culture of ferrari because so much you know a lot of teams are very uh, multicultural but ferrari is a team where everyone's italian you know especially there so i, I think the language thing is definitely important i'm actually surprised he doesn't speak a uh, kind of more italian yet but in terms of how, you know, if you, you know, I think you said out of 10, I'd give him, you know, a six out of 10 so far because he's done a good job, but nothing more. You know, this team is still struggling. Let's not forget 
this result is great, and I think a lot of people are going to forget what happened last, uh, you know, the previous race in Zandvoort, which was a horrible weekend for them. You know, I, I think what Carlos Sainz did to get to sixth in Zandvoort was actually a really good result. So it's an up and down, it's an up and down kind of season for them. They're, they've been strong on the tracks where the car kind of suits the, the tracks, like again, Baku and Monza. But how they're going to get in Singapore, you know, that's that's a completely different type of track. So I think Fred Vasseur has done a good job to kind of build a hopefully a better environment after after Bonotto and kind of restart things. But it's too early to say that he's a massive success or anything like that. He needs two, three years in the job, I think. But hang on, you called uh, Fred Vasseur, uh, you gave him a six out of ten? A six out of ten so far, yeah. But that's not fair. What do you expect him to do in a couple of months? Turn, go go for turn the whole Ferrari team from a, from a P5 six to to dominating or what? Like I don't know. At uh, the same time, the he's done. They've definitely dropped results. I think they've definitely underdelivered on on certain weekends, and that's why I think for him, it's I, I get what you mean in terms of what do I expect. I'm not saying he should be winning the championship, but I think also with some of the reliability and some of the things that the ways handle the media, I think there's just a little bit more because I'm seeing more of the excuses, you know, and like there was last year. And I think there needs to be a bit more accountability. So, I mean, what would you rate him out of ten? Do you think he's done yeah, a on, perfect job? Well, at least an eight. I mean, he's only had a couple of months. What, what can one expect? And from what I see, I think he's really making good progress within the team and is establishing himself and and um, I would give him an eight out of ten. Yeah. I think next okay. year's the big one, though. Next year's the big one. He's had a, he's had an entire season. Next year they're gonna we'll see what we'll see what the car is like, but that's when he'll really have the influence on the team. So I think next year's the really big one to judge him, in my opinion. Of course, we've only had a couple of months. He can't do miracles. <laughs> although, although, although uh, James vows that Williams has done miracles. Yeah, yeah. So, so there you go. Maybe it's possible. possible. So maybe I'll, yeah, I'm gonna tend more towards you again now, Aldous, for uh, Fred Vasseur. <laughs> no, but because James vows that Williams has been amazing. Huh? So what he's done is he, he he's already like reorganized the whole communication within the team within Williams because um, the arrow was not really communicating well with the. With the simulation, with the with the chassis construction side and things, and you just reorganize the communication, and already that apparently has uh, has really had a, a big impact in their in their progress. So uh, that's been lovely to see. And brought yeah. in Pat Fry as well from from Alpine. So you talk about yeah, he's only sure you know Fred Vasseur has also only had kind of a similar time, but when you look at Vals, he's brought key people from Alpine. I think the way he, uh, the culture Alex Albon has just been even better this year. So I do think a team principal, you know, even a short time can still have a, a big effect. So so how I mean, many? How much do you rate? Uh, what rating do you give James Vowles? Oh, James Vowles. I mean, nine out of ten. I've got to leave a bit of room for perfection, but nine out of ten for the way he's kind of just the environment around Williams. It's so great to see them. I think what he's done for to build for the future. He's got a big. Uh, he's got a big decision to make with Logan Sargent, which I think is also going to affect. Uh, his future as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing what he does with Logan. Okay, I'll give him a 10 out of 10. I didn't see any, uh, I don't see anything he could have done better. <laughs> I'm a hard task master, master, clearly. Itself. Rate, rate, rate the team principles so far for the season. Um, fascinating, fascinating. I, I Just just to bring it back onto Ferrari, I think, and, and I'm going to refer actually to a tweet you you did, Aldous, over the weekend, that this, this potentially was quite a big weekend for Ferrari in that they now leapfrog Aston Martin in the Constructors Championship. So they're now on 228 points, Aston are behind on 217. And it perhaps points to the importance of having two drivers who can consistently bring in points. I'm going to tell you what, what each driver has got between the two. So Carlos is on 117, Charles on 111. Alonso, though, is on 170 compared to Stroll on 47. So Nico... What do you think, or how important is it to have two drivers getting points week in, week out? Um, no, of course, it's fundamental. And I'm not really sure what's happened to Lance Stroll there, um, because he's a very decent driver, you know, and he showed in the beginning of the season how he can stay close to, to Fernando. When Fernando was third, uh, Lance was fifth or sixth. Um, so I'm not really sure what's happened to him there, but he's really in a difficult phase now. Um, and I think long term for Aston... They, they can't really uh, allow themselves to have one driver who's that far off. Uh, so either Lance gets back to where he can be and where he should be, or uh, they're going to have to start thinking about um, changing uh, changing things around there with the second driver. Because also they need some. I mean, Fernando needs to be pushed. Um, the setup work is much better when there's two drivers who are on it. You know, they, they push it. The whole, it has a whole different dynamic. So it's very important to have two, two drivers who are um, very quick. Mm. Can you see, Nico, a situation where, and obviously we know Lawrence Stroll, Lance's dad, 
does own the team. So can you ever see a situation where Lawrence is outing his own son from the team? It's very impossible for me to judge. Um, probably it would it would more be Lance saying, "Hey, you know what? Uh, um, I think I should go and do something something else or whatever." If 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 he continues to struggle the way the way he is at the moment, um, it's it's a really difficult situation to judge from the outside. I mean, I I think the easiest would be if Lance somehow finds a way back to where he has been and where he can be, which is not too far from Fernando. Mm. Yeah, I, I listened to a lot of his interviews this weekend. He was really despondent. I mean, he obviously had the FP1 session where Felipe was in the was in the car, then ha- then had a mechanical issue in FP2, qualified 20th and finished P16. I mean, Aldous, you're, sh- you're shaking your head at the very mention of Lance. What, what have you made of his performance so far? I guess in that race, but also across the season. I think this weekend, I, t- I totally understand him missing FP1 and FP2, but he shouldn't have been qualifying last. He's a really experienced Formula One driver. How many years has he been in Formula One? Maybe eight years or something. Mm. He's, driv- he's driven around Monza millions of times. He's scored a podium, uh, started on the front row. He knows this track very well. He knows the car very well. He should not, even with one practice session, just FP3, he should not have been qualifying last in that car. So especially when, you know, your teammate is getting into Q3. So it's been, I'm probably not as high on Lance as perhaps Nico is. I think that at the beginning of the season, the gap to Alonso was still quite big. I know he was... He was recovering from an injury, of course, but there's there's just something strange about the dynamic of that team because for a long time, I mean, they've had seven podiums and now they've fallen behind. They've had more podiums than Ferrari and now they've fallen behind them in the constructors. This team, they should be second with two good drivers. They still should be second in the constructors because of their amazing start with Fernando. What was it like six podiums in five races or something? So it's, and it's a weird dynamic because, you know, Nico says that, oh, perhaps it, sh- it will be Lance who will come in and say, you know, maybe it's time for me to do something else. But that shouldn't be the case. Your boss should tell you you're not doing good enough and you need to improve. Otherwise, you're going to be out. That's Formula One. Unless you're obviously, you know, a world champion and you can say, you know, I've, I'm, I'm leaving the sport now like Nico did. He has that luxury. I don't think Lance should because he's not doing a good enough job. So, but again, who's going to make that decision? Who is going to walk into the boss's office and say, Lawrence, I know you you own the team. I know that you've put so much into it and we do have a bright future, but your sign is now the limiting factor at this team because we should be second in the constructors with two with two drivers. I think the problem with Lance is that he is a good driver. Now, don't get me wrong. I think he deserves to be in Formula One. I think if he was in a Alfa Romeo or a Haas or something, I think that's where his level has been. When he was given a car that was the second the second best car or the third best car on the grid, he wasn't able to raise his game. And going into those kind of cars asks you a very different type of questions when there's, you know, podiums on the table and he just hasn't been able to deliver at that level. So I think that's the problem. He is the limiting factor at the moment at Aston Martin. And how long is this going to continue until someone says enough is enough? So I don't know who that person is. No, but the problem is it's more, it's not Formula One here. It's a father-son relationship also. Um, This is, uh, that's the challenge, you know, and that's the... That's what matters here then eventually. So it's a diff- diff- it's a very difficult one. But also, I mean, if Aston was second in the constructors, I think that's 30 million or so more in uh, revenues from, from the TV money share. Um, uh, something like that number, if I had to guess now, um, from second to fourth place in the constructors championship. So there's a lot of um, a lot of money that's um, at stake there as, as well. Yeah, it's an expensive business having a Formula One team, but then also having your son in it and and not performing. Uh, if, well, if actually, uh, actually, it was, I think it was an incredible investment in hindsight from yeah, Lawrence yeah. Stroll <laughs> in terms of timing because he buys the team where the yeah. teams were still very cheap, um, and then the budget comes cap comes in and teams valuations multiply by almost 10 probably and suddenly almost all teams on the grid are profitable teams um yeah. which is i mean an incredible change in f1 for f1 and some of the top teams the amount of money they're making is like in- incredible and also just quickly what lawrence did to buy aston martin Lagonda, like the car brand as well and kind of connect that uh, with you know with the car side and the racing side there's a lot of exciting things going on at aston martin just the brand uh, and also with the formula one team as well but Again, that should there's bigger results on the track for them to have, and I know you said this is a father son thing, but business has to, you know, this is Formula One. This is not a you know father and son play thing. So at what point does the business kind of side, you know, click into Lawrence's head that and say, I'm leaving so much money on the table because our drivers aren't good enough. So that's uh, how long can this continue? That's all. I, that's you know, that's all I'm thinking at the moment. Mm. Time will tell. Certainly, time will tell. Uh, let's let's move on to talk about 
Well, talk about Red Bull in the sense of now it's 10 wins in a row for Max Verstappen, which is just an incredible achievement. He, he's won, or sorry, Red Bull have won 24 out of the last 25 races. Incredible numbers. And I think it's also a case of it doesn't necessarily look like that's going to change over the next few races. It looks like that number could, could creep up to 11, 12, 13. Who knows after that? I've got a tweet here uh, that says, which circuit is the most likely one where Ferrari and co could beat Red Bull? Nico, where do you think... Red Bull are going to struggle, or where yeah, they can start, more with, the start with Singapore. We can yeah. start with Singapore because it's just such a challenging weekend, and if it rains and things, it's such a difficult track. Uh, a lot of mistakes. It's very easy to make mistakes. Also, qualifying to get that right. So, I would say uh, Singapore is high downforce, complete opposite. Um, that's probably uh, probably a good place to start. And may I ask, uh, Matt, who got the uh, twenty four out of twenty five wins went to Red Bull? Who got the twenty fifth? It was it must Russell. be George Russell. Yeah, Sao Paulo. Last year, that's it. That's Amazing. from from George when Le- great. Yeah, from when Leclerc mm. won. Can you, I mean just like just thinking about that? The last time, kind of from when Leclerc won in Austria last year. That seems almost years ago now. We've only had one non Red Bull win, and I think yeah, in terms of tracks where they might get tripped up, Singapore is definitely the right answer because uh, tricky track. Like you said, if if weather comes into it, then it's a bit you know. Then it's a total, uh, total unknown. I think the only one maybe again is kind of maybe Sao Paulo, maybe Las Vegas because it's brand new, so they don't have as much kind of information around that track. But I mean, we're we're kind of clutching at straws here because Red Bull are so strong, they're so smart. Max is so consistent, and also just in terms of the way the team operates, forget about the driver for a second. They're just they're just really good from top to finish in terms of strategy, in terms of pit stops. Make sure they have all of the data that that's available. So. Yeah, if anything, it's going to be, I think, those tracks, you know, the likes of Singapore, Sao Paulo, maybe Vegas. But yeah, we're going to have to wait and see, aren't we? We are. I thought, Nico, your old boss, Toto, was was pretty interesting yesterday when he was talking about the records um, that Red Bull had broken. He said, those numbers, it is for Wikipedia and nobody reads that anyway. So, Nico, take us inside the Toto's office. Did he really care about records? Oh, I think, um, yeah, that was... Uh... I think Toto was got on a, got in a moment there where where he was not too happy about his own uh, race team's performance on the weekend um, because of course uh, where, where did they finish fifth and uh, fifth and sixth no fifth yeah. and sixth yeah so yeah. finishing fifth and sixth and miles behind Ferrari and Red Bull is not really um, the goal so I think Toto was just a, a bit down there and that made his answer a bit darker <laughs> and not quite <laughs> as gracious not quite as gracious as perhaps he would normally be. Um, because I think the right answer would have been, yeah. I mean, hats off and respect to uh, to Red Bull for their um, for that for that for this these achievements. Mm. But did he did he care about records when when you were racing with him? Did he did he, of course. as you were breaking records? Yeah, we all care about records, of course, and we think a lot about records. So um, even Max, who always says, "No, I don't care about ten races." What does he do when he comes out the car? He puts uh, <laughs> both of his hands up and points to the world that that's ten in a row. Yeah. Uh, and just before he's been saying, oh, no, I don't care about 10. I just want to do a good race weekend. Um, so even Max cares about records. Yeah, surely, surely every driver does. I mean, it's, it's a chance to write yourself in history, isn't it? Um, OK, a couple, couple more tweets. Uh, uh, for, what This one from Anthony, which, Nico, I'm, I'm sure you got this a lot this weekend. Nico, can you take a selfie with Max in Singapore before the race? <laughs> oh yes this is re- so this referring is, uh, to the yeah. this is the curse uh, thing i even tried this weekend i tried to do a neutral background um because i thought i don't want to play any uh, cause any problems here yeah but um, you put forza ferrari in the caption you curse yeah, ferrari. Okay, uh, forza ferrari because the whole weekend was about that and all of us are wishing for ferrari to win um so i thought yeah so maybe i'm not even allowed to do that then apparently um so yes i understand that i should be uh, taking a picture but that would be a bit like that would be a bit aggressive huh? if i then take a picture uh, with max yeah. before um before a race that would not be cool i think yeah but I i'll do it anyway know... i'll do it there anyways. we go there we go <laughs> that's the spirit are you in singapore no 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 i'm oh. just in, i think just one more uh, qatar now Oh, okay, fine. All right. Well, there we go. We'll see what happens in Qatar, who, who you're going to take a photo with. Um, another tweet. This is from Das uh, to Nico. If you got offered a drive in Red Bull next year, would you take it, even if you were the Red Bull second driver? Well, I mean, would I take it? No, because I'm very happy with where I am in my life. But um, if I was Hypothetically, like... Hypothetically. But if, if I you... was like someone like Alex Albon... Um, it really depends. Uh, it depends. It's a difficult one because... 
you know that you're just not going to have a chance against Max because no one in the world will have a chance against Max. So, you yes, you have the best car, you can win races, you can be in the best team, but do you really do you accept to put yourself into a place where you're going to be a number two? That's a decision that you have to uh, you have to ask yourself. Where someone like Daniel Ricciardo, um, who like a couple of years ago would never have accepted that, now by now he's in a place where he says, okay, listen. Max is um, going to be one of the top five of all time, on, in line with Senna, Schumacher, Hamilton, Fangio. Um, and it would just still be lovely to be back at Red Bull and, and kind of accept that I probably will be more of a number two um, there. Um, so depends on, on you as a driver. I, I personally would not do it because, uh, because um, he has so much experience in that team he has. Uh, it's almost impossible for me, even in, in my prime, to go in there, and then and then expect to be able to dominate him. That's like uh, not realistic. So um, I would probably not. Uh, I would not have done it. I don't think. I do actually just quickly ask Nico if you were in that Red Bull though, how do you think you would do relative to Perez? Then how would you, in terms of what he's in terms of what he's been able to achieve? Well, I mean, I, I put Max on the same level as Lewis. So that's how I would do. I mean, you went to a title decider with Lewis and won. So, yeah. So that's how I would. Uh, that's how I would do. That would be my best guess. Not bad. I'd, I, I, yeah, I think some of us would love to see that. <laughs> if you do fancy <laughs> coming out for retirement, fiction. Nico, <laughs> let's forget it. Let's forget about that. That's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> if you do fancy it, I'm sure there'd be a fair few fans who'd want to see it. Uh, okay, let's let's move on and, and just talk about Mercedes. Um, I've got a tweet here from Jude. Uh, what are the expectations regarding Mercedes for the rest of the season? All this, I'll come to you on this. What? What, do you, what, do you, what are you expecting to see for, from, from the Silver Arrows? I definitely expect them to lock out uh, P2 and the constructors. I think their driver lineup is very strong. I think their car works on a decent kind of, um, kind of a nice amount of tracks. The Ferrari's kind of up and down. Um, and that's kind of all they can because they're focusing on next year uh, for sure. But that's, I think that's the only expectation. More podiums from Lewis, but they've got to secure that P2 and the constructors because their car, I think, is good enough. Um, but I'm interested to see what uh, Nico uh, thinks about Mercedes uh, for the rest of the year. Well, they're fully focused all on next year now. Uh, therefore, it just is what it is now. And um, with the car they have, yes, I th they can secure second place and probably jump Alonso in the drivers' championship. Uh, I think Lewis should be able to still get ahead of him. Um, and that, that's it. I, I don't think we should expect much more because everybody's hundred percent on next year. Mm. What what what's going on then, Nico? Take take us inside the factory at Mercedes. What what will be the conversations? What will be the process in order to get back to the front of the grid next year? Well, certainly a lot of it has to be to keep analysing that Red Bull car. Because also Christian Horner was telling me after the race that he thinks everything is going to be much closer next year because everybody's just going to copy their car. Um, that was his, uh, his thought after the race in Monza. Um, and I think all teams need to do that. They need to understand exactly what Red Bull is doing there and, and probably just go down that route as much as possible. Um, which is what McLaren has done um, to some extent, you know, and it just worked wonders for them straight away. I mean, just switched on the car straight away. So, um, so all teams are going to be trying to uh, to do that. Also, understanding what has McLaren done to make such a jump, because that's been incredible. I mean, what a turn of form they've had. That's very rare to see that during a season to see such a big jump. You know, they've done an exceptional job. Mm. What's the impact then of the of the new contracts for George and Lewis? Do you think that allows Mercedes to have stability into next year? It now kind of just grounds everyone within the team and says, right, we are fully focused on 2024. We've got our drivers. We've got everyone around us. Let's let's go for it. Yeah, sure. I think just put stability, calmness, uh, because it's uh, it's it always leads to uncertainty. Or even in the leadership, oh, Lewis is not signed yet. Uh, it puts stress, puts stress, because what if Lewis suddenly decides, oh, actually prefer to go uh, surfing on the beach um that would be uh, that would be a big problem then you know so it does put stress especially probably on someone like toto even though he wouldn't show it because he's an incredible incredibly good negotiator <laughs> and pretty cold but uh in, in a, inside certainly it puts stress mm. yeah uh, a couple of other stories to wrap up uh, liam lawson i think we should i think we should have a quick chat about him because he finished 11th yesterday in the race, which is the highest that second Alpha Tauri has finished all season. The best De Vries finish was 12th. Ricardo managed to get his best, was it was 13th. Um, so, Aldous, what, what do you make of Liam Lawson's last two races, his debut in Formula One? 
I've been really impressed the way he's hit the ground running. I thought Zandvoort was such a... That was a tricky one. That was that was one of those where if, if he went off the road, if he crashed out in the race because of his inexperience and obviously him making his debut, we could have been very easily saying, well, you know, he's he's obviously a rookie. He's not had that experience. And look, loads of the drivers went off, but he had a really professional first race, just focused on getting it home, learning what he can. And then this was the weekend to really perform because, again, he's been to Monza loads of times like all drivers, you know, have throughout their single-seater careers. He knows the car a little bit more. And I mean, he was with Yuki straight away. If that was if that was a Daniel Ricciardo or a Nick De Vries in that car, we would have been like, you know, yeah, that's that's what the dri- that's what that kind of driver should be doing, you know. But so he he looked really professional, really like he had been there all season. And he is that, that's a problem for Ricciardo because obviously Ricciardo potentially wants to be in that Red Bull for next year. If he can't, then he wants to be in, potentially in the Alpha Tauri. And Lawson is really staking a claim that not only should he be in Formula One but potentially in that team. So. I'm really excited. He's a really good driver, obviously fighting for the championship in Super Formula, currently second, and he's going to have more races and in, in that car whilst Daniel is still recovering. So there is no better place to prove that you should be in Formula 1 than when you're actually in the car whilst another driver is out. And that, I think Red Bull have a really big choice to make out of who should be in their seats for next year and someone's going to get left out. Hopefully Lawson, even if he doesn't end up in the Alpha Tauri, is still somehow in Formula 1. Maybe there's a deal with Williams where they perhaps will take him instead of Sargent, I don't know, but... I've been really impressed. I think, yeah. That's a nice. Uh, that's a nice idea, Aldous. So, so Tsunoda and Ricciardo at um, at Alpha Tauri, and then Lawson at Williams. That would make a lot of sense. Um, I think that's a good one. I just on, the only thing with that though is I think Williams. I think they would take him because of how impressive he's been. But I think they would be cautious of are we just developing a driver that you're then going to put in the Alpha Tauri that's going to come back against us. That's the only thing. I'd want mm. him to not be Red Bull associated. If I was if I was James Vowles and would take him in the Williams, that's the only uh, kind well, of that's like. That's not going to happen. That's not yeah, happen. exactly. Mm. But that's that's for the negotiating table, clearly. <laughs> Nico, what do you think Liam Lawson's last two performances have done for Daniel Ricciardo? Where does that leave him now? No, Lawson. First of all, I, I, I agree with all this that um, it was really uh, really a good job, especially in Monza. Incredible jump in the car and you're well, how much was he behind? One and a half tenths or something from Tsunoda, or I think one and a half tenths. Um, that's really awesome because Tsunoda's fast, so that's a super drive, uh, and then good race, good race pace, and everything. Um, for, how unlucky has that been for Daniel though? It's incredible. You get this chance to come back and you break your hand in a in a freak accident. Um, so unlucky. So the latest from Christian Horner is that Daniel will be back in Qatar, so he still misses a couple of races, and then then we'll be able to come back because it's quite a apparently quite a decent break of the hand he's he's had there. So. Um, yeah, um, and it, it makes it difficult. But but Daniel has such a value to to Red Bull, and he's so liked by Red Bull that they'll definitely be patient in giving him a definite, a clear, clear chance. Uh, but I think it might this this break could actually be the difference between him getting the shot and replacing Perez next year and having another year in AlphaTauri. I think the handbrake could be uh, could have the effect of of putting him into one year more in AlphaTauri. Mm. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I find I find it fascinating that I mean, what for example, if Liam Lawson has an amazing result, say he gets a P P four, P five, P six in the next race, are they really going to bring Daniel Ricciardo back? You know, would, would they still have that goodwill towards Daniel Ricciardo? Do you think? Yeah, of course. Come on, Daniel is Daniel, and and they would have the whole world against themselves. I mean, they they cannot not bring him back. The poor guy uh, broke his hand. Um, you, you cannot then, I mean, no way. So, um, or, or you say you're back in the car for next year, but let's have Liam finish the season because we need to yeah. evaluate him now or whatever, perhaps, but, but you need to have Daniel back at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, quick look at Singapore be- before we go. Uh, Nico, you won there, of course, in, in 2016 on your way to the world championship. What do you expect from Singapore? I mean, you alluded to it earlier. It's a it, quality is important, but also it's a tricky, tight track with, you know, we might get some weather. You know, what, what are your expectations ahead of Singapore? Oh, Singapore is such a difficult track. It's really, really it has the, one of the tracks with the most corners, I think, in the year as well. Just never ending corner after corner. Um, really difficult to get set up right to get your tires working properly uh, and um, so I'm expecting maybe we can have some surprises also with some teams suddenly going extremely well uh, a little bit in a surprising way and um, so no I think it's going to be refreshing Mm. Aldous looking forward to Singapore? Yeah absolutely especially off the back of Monza because maybe apart from Monaco you could not have a more different track 
uh, to, to Monza. So I'm expecting Ferrari to not be as strong. I think Mercedes, I'm expecting actually Aston Martin and especially Alonso uh, to be a lot stronger on that kind of, you know, that kind of track, uh, less kind of high, you know, high downfall. So I'm looking forward to it. It's, it's always a big challenge. Last year we had the weather, which produced a, a crazy race. I mean, Max off, Lewis off, you know, overtakes and even a few crashes and obviously uh, Checo kind of holding on for the win. Uh, it can, yeah, it's one of those tracks, massive, obviously, challenge for the drivers. I couldn't even begin to imagine, like, how tough it is just physically. Forget about the driving and the mental side. So, yeah, it's it's a big challenge and uh, always a always an amazing venue. So, yeah, yeah let's, touch about the, let's touch about the physic, on the physical side that you just touched. Um, so, I would lose four, so eight pounds, eight pounds of body weight from sweating in the two hours. Um, and wow. you're like in your skiing suit, you know, and you're sitting on the, on the asphalt, which is 40, 45 degrees. Um, and, uh, and then you have the, the petrol right behind you, which is at 65 degrees or something like that. So it's just so extremely hot. There's no fresh air coming in. You have the seat belts really tight. You have your carbon seat molded to your body, so you can hardly breathe properly. Um, corner after corner where you have to hold your breath in the corners. You can't breathe when you're cornering, you're holding your breath. Um, and I would remember that after like 10 laps, I would then look at the, my pit board from my mechanics and it would say uh, 50 laps to go. And I'm, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm done. I'm done. I'm 10 laps in, I'm done. And it says 50 laps to go. And it's also the longest race because unlike Monaco, they keep it at 300 kilometers there. Uh, so it's also very often close to a two hour race. It's so horrible, like the feeling in the car. Um, it's like you're in a sauna on a spinning bike for two hours. You know, it's like, yes. it's horrible. And then your head is starting to pump within the helmet. Uh, you, your sweat is dripping down into your eyes and burning. And, and um, it's really incredibly tough. But then mm. winning it, when you win in that environment, Nico, like you did in 2016, it must be even more special to know that you've conquered that kind of challenge. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And my, my 2016 win was ultra high pressure because um, they pitted Lewis behind to try and uh, to try and get him back on the podium. And that caused a, a whole like Constantina effect where everybody behind me pitted and suddenly went on soft new tires. But I was the only one who couldn't pit anymore. Um, and so I had Ricciardo chasing me down and he finished only four tenths, four tenths behind me after like it was a, was a guaranteed win for me. And, uh, and so that was like a ultra pressure moment on my way to the championship yeah it's going to be a fascinating race we've got a weekend off of course uh, but we will be back after the singapore grand prix to look back at that as well uh nico aldous thank you so much for your time really appreciate it uh until next tuesday see you then bye for now bye 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 sky sports f1 feel it all